do the thing. Oh my god, I don't know if any of this worked. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Did it work? <laughs> did we? Are we live? We're here? We did. I think we, we did, did it. it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just came in with the same energy of somebody who, like, just uh, spilled hot oil all over the place while cooking. Um, <clears throat> which is a little bit <laughs> how I feel. <laughs> start streaming for the first time after like a month so um anyway hi everybody welcome um holy crap uh yeah well hello wel welcome back everybody happy new year everyone that is oddly specific not based on a real example um no, not. <laughs> um the <clears throat> I, hey. I'll be honest with you. I truly don't remember how to do this. Um, it's right. bad enough if we don't stream for one week, let alone four of them. Hold truly, on. for the last like forty minutes uh, pre-show, while we were on call, we were just like frantically running around, going like, "How do we do this thing?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, so you know this 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 stream brought to you by Pandemonium. Um, Probably one of the worst one. possible planes of existence to be on. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yes. Um, Hi. Sorry, I don't remember how to talk to people, let alone uh, a camera. Um, welcome, everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome to the uh, the the new year of rule of lore. Um, <laughs> this is. What? Hold on, hold on. I'm doing math real quick. This is what our the beginning of our fourth year. Is that true? No, it's not. This is the beginning of our third year of actual yeah. streaming. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. Hold on, I'm scrolling up because yeah. Okay, cool. Um. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're back, yeah. everybody. We're back tonight. First and foremost, with uh, an episode of Ramblemancy, where we'll be talking about TTRPGs and rewarding players in TTRPGs, and just rewards <clears throat> in TTRPGs in general. Um, and no, this, uh, as is, uh, my, my, my words so far have not made evident, this is not an ad for the, uh, for the word, for the term TTRPGs. Um, <clears throat> but that's what's happening tonight. We're going to be talking all about that. But before we get into that, we'll be doing a little bit of a, like, dive into some of the changes coming to Rule of Lore this year. Um, and I think you will all be very interested in what we're doing. Holy crap. There are bits being thrown everywhere. Oh, my gosh. Hype. Level 3 hype train. Hermes Littlest Drummer, thank you so much for the bits. Um, and thank you, everybody, for, who has uh, subbed and resubbed so far. <laughs> thank you. All right. So, um, is, uh, is, John, is the bar tracking the subs? It appears to be a little behind. Okay, cool. It's doing its best. I'm going to try refreshing it and see if it'll, like, hold on. Give me one. You know what? It, I, I'm not going to do that, apparently, because. It might. That's bizarre. We've had. All right. All right, I'm gonna scroll up here. We've had one. Hmm, no. technology you know what? things. It's fine. We'll figure it out. Um, Bard, oh, welcome, 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 welcome. Um, hello, Bardo. Okay, so let's. There are many of us. <sighs> okay, everybody, stop for stop. Hold on to something. Okay, cool. holding. Oh That's God! <laughs> That did not. <laughs> Freeman okay. role playing what will happen if you do not hold on to something right now. One of these days we'll start this episode. Um, <laughs> the on screen text window really? isn't working. Wait, what on screen text window? Are you talking about captions? Oh, oh yeah, chat's not showing it up. It definitely. Uh, oh, the chat widget. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Why is that not working? Hold on. <clears throat> oh. Is it. New Year? Oh, I know what happened. Issues. I think it's oh. just. This is a classic on. case of a uh, layer in the wrong spot. Listen. <laughs> okay, Listen, there we go. I've done I it. I did it. it like four times today it's while fine. I was working on it. Everything's <laughs> fine. Um, there, the chat's working now. <laughs> Spigs, hello. Spigs. Oh, my gosh. All right. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this again. 
now that everything seems to be working most new year new bug exactly um <laughs> <laughs> and hi oh my gosh welcome back everybody to a brand new year of rule of lore content the beginning of our third year of streaming it 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 blows yeah me like... yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. genuinely and like it is, it is actually kind of the beginning of a new year stream because we did start streaming um, Ramble Nancy about February. in January. Didn't it was we? February. Like February. Yeah, beginning mm-hmm. like yeah. middle, early middle of February. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like our our three year stream anniversary is coming up here. It's it's happening. Um, technically, okay. Look, if you want to be really specific, our very first stream ever was in was actually in January, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Where we had like our our whole like. Hey, we're rule of lore. This is what true. we're doing. This is what we're what's going on. Ask us some questions. And very uh, true. When where Caitlin saved our ass by coming in and asking cool questions and like <laughs> and getting people talking, where we were just very awkward. You could pro you actually probably can't find that stream any well. Did we Maybe. highlight did we know about highlighting back then? I think we did. You could probably find that stream if you dig back there. far enough in the like- uh, Don't do it though. It's not gonna be good. It's good. Just not good, unless you really want to see uh, and appreciate what we do now. Um, You'll have to go through all the D and DR first. <laughs> yeah. Ramble Mancy in this economy, yes, koala. Hello, by the way. Um, <laughs> Is that the koala aqua bear? <laughs> okay, announcements for real. We're gonna get this fucking stream started. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it for real. We're, we're doing this shit. Okay, uh, so. Our biggest changes this year are going to be to our Patreon and what we are doing with our Patreon. So, uh, some really cool stuff coming. I'll, I'll go through it uh, in order to build hype in, like, order of, like, least coolness to most coolness in my personal estimation. So, we'll go through it. Um, so, there are going to be changes coming at basically every tier Um except there's there's currently I, there's no plans to change the first like the one dollar tier so um now uh so but as far as like the, the five dollar tier and the ten dollar tier there are some and eventually the 25 dollar tier we'll we'll come back to that um but for now i'm here to talk to you about the middle two tiers which is where most of our patrons are um so first of all I'll talk about the changes to our $10 tier, which is our world builders. Um, So um, we are at our $10 tier. We're going to be adding in some new stuff. So for those of you who don't know, the way our world building works currently is that once a month, the last Tuesday of the month, the Patreon world builders get together with myself and John And we have, like, John and I come up with, like, a topic or something that we want to build into our uh, kind of collaboratively with our patrons uh, in our, um, (sighs) for, like, Infinite Horizon currently. Sorry, I got distracted because this is always going to happen. I got distracted because I realized I made a mistake. I made a mistake not acknowledging in the chaos of starting the stream for the first time in a month i made a mistake not acknowledging one megan murphy or murphy pop art for this brand new overlay around us and all these cool graphics and everything and i am so sorry that's my bad i was just it fully in the middle of panic so um thank you so much megan these are incredible i uh i love them uh, these like this overlay, the graphics, in- absolutely incredible. Makes it so easy to work with. Thank you so much. Um, yes, John. Follow Megan current- on Twitter. They do amazing work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you, Megan. <laughs> thanks, Megan. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Now back to what I was saying. <laughs> uh, the world builders. We get together. We work on something. Uh, a topic chosen by John and. O- or and or myself uh, to kind of bring something cool into Infinite Horizon or whatever our main stream, uh, uh, our main TTRPG stream happens to be at the time. Now, not everybody is always going to be able to make those meetings as we have seen already. And so we wanted to try to find a way to get uh, everybody kind of 
uh, to be able to participate even if you can't be at those meetings because schedules are what they are. They, As everybody knows, schedules are the true BBEG of TTRPGs. So, um, so what we have kind of decided that we're going to start doing um, with our world building tier is that for everyone who can't make it to the meetings, we will start putting out a prompt uh, for, to asking for um, for any kind of like well, like a, a word, a phrase, or a concept that you want us to work on and make something out of in the actual meeting that you can't make it to. Um, and of course, even if you can make it to the meeting, you can still you're still welcome to participate in this. All of this is going to be happening through our Discord, as per usual. Now, the other thing with our with our ten dollar tier is that not everybody is going to be interested in uh, doing the world building stuff or engaging with us in that way. So, John, if you wouldn't mind letting them know what we've chosen to do with that. So in addition to having uh, the Patreon writers remove the $10 tier, we're also adding um, a new sort of like monthly town hall meeting, which uh, like patrons at that tier and above will be able to sit down with us and just kind of like chat with us, have a little bit of a Q&A and have their own kind of like, you know, private patron community chat with us and some of the creators here at Rule of Lore. So you can hear about like upcoming content, kind of get little like uh, teasers from us about those things, pick our brains about whatever it is that we're currently doing, um, ask us questions, and then just generally hang out. Um, and we are, you know, we're also uh, thinking about recording those so that people who can't make it to those can also enjoy kind of the the news and the conversation afterwards. So those will be, those will be, that's something else that we're uh, planning to add to the $10 tier that I think is very exciting. I'm very, I'm very, I'm pumped for some of those, some of those hangouts, so. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> those are the changes coming to the $10 tier, uh, which we're very excited about. So now you can have an opportunity to be a world builder, not just in the sense of our streamed games, but also in the sense of the rule of lore community, uh, in a sense. So it's still world building. It still counts. Uh, anyway, <laughs> just <laughs> met, the meta world, oh. like it's world, world, Never mind. You know what I'm saying? And folks who come in at that tier also have an opportunity to kind of tell us like things that they want to see us do things that they'd like to you know kind of weigh in on on like on what they would like to see you know on the channel on the patreon and that kind of stuff so it does give you a little bit of a little bit of a, like a little bit more of a voice kind of in the in the stuff that listen on the channel so yeah um to that end actually before i get to like the more exciting stuff uh we we have decided that the game with Patreon is going to be a lot less of us trying to guess what people might want and a lot more of just asking people. So uh, we will be dropping a Google form, probably in the Discord, um, where y'all can... Uh, we might even share it on Twitter at some point. Um, but the uh, so just to get some feedback from all of you, uh, you can weigh in on what you might want to see in the Patreon, what you think is working, what you think isn't working. Um, what you think you would, uh, yeah, what, what you, how you think it might be improved, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, keep an eye on out on that. John, do you have specific dates for that? Um, I, uh, I was planning on dropping that, sending it out with the announcements this Sunday. So keep an eye on our weekly announcements in the discord. I'll throw it in the announcements. Um, and then I'll also, uh, drop it in the stream suggestion box. So it's in a couple of places. Uh, and I'll probably also tweet out that same form, um, early next week as well to kind of give people who follow us uh, more on Twitter an opportunity to also weigh in on that. So Yeah. Um, cool. So now for what I think is the most exciting thing that we will be doing. Uh, we have a new item coming to our $5 tier called uh, Beyond the Roll. Freeman, do you want to take a stab at explaining this? And <laughs> Oh, Boy, do I, because <laughs> I tell you, I had a, a, a brain moment with that title. Um, uh, basically, access to Beyond the Roll is like a series of episodic canon adjacent stories starring more or less a rotating cast of all of your favorite rule of lore faces here. So it's going to be going into stories, um, offshoots from what we've been watching, whether it is... Um, well, pretty much whatever. I don't know. I'm trying to be vague, but it's not working. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Basically, just like 
like I said, just little offshoots of stories that happen off of the live stream. So it'll be like things that we do off camera that we upload later for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, that could be anything from like, uh, like side missions from our, uh, from like our main shows that we just wouldn't have time to cover during the actual streams, or it could be a return to some uh, one-offs that you've seen us do in the past, um, revisiting certain characters and worlds and stories. Um, it'll give us an opportunity to uh, to basically explore more of some of the worlds that all of us have come to love that we might not have time to do during our regular streaming schedule. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we are very, ex very excited to uh, to be doing Beyond the Roll this year. And uh, I think we can probably announce what we're doing first, right? Yeah, because we're ready. I think we should. We should. We're ready. Like we are. We are. We're. We're. We're recording it this very Sunday, if I remember correctly. That so. sounds probably correct. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's one. Of, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this. Uh, this soon. I don't know exactly when it's going to be released on our Patreon. We will let you know ahead of time. But we will be. Uh, we'll be making a return to Night City. Um, Woo! from our, uh, our thunder and blood, uh, th four, three shot. Was it three? Ep I don't remember how many episodes. It was three episodes. Three, oh, three shot. It, it was three episodes. I don't know anything anymore. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Our, our thunder and blood three shot, our cyberpunk red, uh, three shot that we did, uh, just last month. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we will be doing a return and this, uh, this upcoming adventure will be featuring, um, our favorite manic mechanic, uh, Jace, oh. um, and hey. as well as a new character, a new one, a new character, one not seen before on Thunder and Blood. Um, John, do you wanna do you wanna say? I would love to okay. say I will be uh, I will be making uh, an appearance on uh, this little sh uh, this this part of the Patreon series as my own. Uh, my very own Cam Fan uh, Cam Fantasmic. There we go. I had to I had to get the pun yeah. right. Uh, who is a um, absolutely incredible rocker boy that I played uh, in some of our test games of Cyberpunk Red that I am very excited to uh, bring into Night City with Jace for what I imagine is going to be the the Cyberpunk equivalent of Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. <laughs> 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 so you will get to see this lovely face role playing right alongside uh, Lucas and Freeman on our Patreon in uh, in Night City. Yeah, I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> Wait, John exists out of Ramble Mancy? I do now. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Excellent. So yeah, that's those are some of the uh, the big exciting changes coming to our Patreon. Um, we are currently working on something to bring because we we also have a twenty five dollar tier, which is largely our legendary uh, legendary heroes. Is that what it's called? Le Hero of legend. Hero of tier? legend. That's what it's called. Mm -hmm. The Hero of legend tier. We're working on um, bringing something to something more to that currently it exists as like a hey this doesn't get you anything more but if you want to support us to an even greater extent we'll love you forever um and but we're working on bringing something a little more exciting to that as well stay tuned we're still working on that one if you listen really closely you can hear the sounds of construction happening frantically in the background on our patreon um pay no <laughs> attention to them they get very self-conscious when they know they're being observed building stuff so mm -hmm. yeah we have the goblins working very hard behind uh behind the scenes they are actually like literally right behind lucas right mm -hmm. now behind yeah, the screen they're behind this yeah, yeah. they've muffled all of their hammers it's very <laughs> kind of them we didn't ask them to do it they just did like <laughs> yeah so yeah uh i think that's all of our patreon news is that correct i do believe that i is think cool. so yeah yeah okay yeah. cool yeah um so, so yeah a lot of exciting stuff coming to our Patreon. We're trying to sort of build our Patreon content sort of into what we do rather than have it be a glorified tip jar like it kind of has been. Um, and of course, you'll see you'll see the continuation of 
uh, stuff that we've been doing already, like our media club recommendations slash non-recommendations, if you mm, saw this most recent one, uh, and also our <laughs> tabletop <wasn't> coaches, <laughs> um, our world building stuff, all that's going to still be there. We're just going to be adding some new stuff, shifting some things around, and just a little bit changing how we do stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That said, we do still have a sub goal going this month. Um, you can spy the little thing down there. It's I'll count out the subs afterwards if it doesn't record them and and set it to have that many. But um, I don't know what it's doing. Yeah, it's been far too long since we hosted an Among Us Discord like community night in the Discord, and I have a mighty need for some stabby space chaos. So that's what we've got as a as a sub goal incentive tonight. <clears throat> but yeah, oh, here I we think, go. Hold on. I think that's okay. That's changed the... nothing. <laughs> the heck! All right, Anna, we'll figure it out later. Yeah. Again. But yeah, I think that just brings us to content announcements, right? Yes. Yes. Content announcements. Just the In Too Deep, which you can see right above chat. Uh, In Too Deep returns for, I'm just going to say, our Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition actual yeah, there play you go. with an all LGBTQ <laughs> yeah. plus cast because it no longer resembles Waterdeep Dragon Heist. No, not even um, a little bit. Legally distinct water deep dragon heist. Um, but yeah, you can catch that uh, on Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. Uh, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, they're coming back uh, again with the same amazing cast as uh, before our hiatus. And then the very next day, Infinite Horizon comes back uh, from our mid-season break <laughs> where we left... <laughs> With you Mason left, certainly in a position. In a position <laughs> for sure. Yeah, we'll say that. <laughs> I thought about that today. How deep is too deep? Well, Littlest Drummer, you're just going to have to tune in and find out. Um, <laughs> deep, 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 deep. Deep, 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 deep. Yep. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think, I, think, I think that might be all of our announcements. I mean, just as a quick reminder, we don't have any specific dates to announce yet but uh a while back we were a we were a kickstarter goal a stretch goal in uh, M uh matthew gravelin's uh clever girl uh kickstarter um and we were we promised to do a raptor stream there were there was talk of a raptor suit and just chaos and shenanigans and that's still happening stay tuned for the announcements for that Matthew and I have been plotting and scheming, and we are now in the stages of collecting all of the things that we need for the stream to happen, i.e. an inflatable raptor suit. So keep your eyes peeled for announcements from here. It's, it's going to be very good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and of course, this will be the first time we've done anything chaotic on this channel ever, so. Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, Mecha Mallmayer was somebody else, right? That was a different channel. Yeah, that was that was definitely. <laughs> also, we did not do an all goblins holiday special, so like that. Didn't no, definitely either. not. Like I thought uh, so. It was yeah. just a weird dream, like right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a very green fever dream <laughs> that we all we all had collectively, though. A shared hallucination. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Amethyst. Thank you. Uh, thank you for bringing that back up. I did catch that. Um. I'm not sure, Hermes, um, if there is a chance to do like a yearly payment on Patreon, just because of the way that Patreon processes things, but we can look into it. I don't think mm. it works that way on Patreon, and we're sort of limited based on like what Patreon allows us to do. So if they have it, we, we can certainly try to look into doing that kind of thing. In a very uh. quick Google search, it seems that Patreon may offer that option, but I think it's something that we have to enable, so we'll look at okay that. yeah we'll we'll definitely check cool. it out hermes um thanks for thanks for uh bringing that up because i honestly had never even considered it so yeah yeah i will i will i will check into that this weekend yeah jake eating during the holiday special was amazing yes truly my favorite <laughs> bit that has ever happened in this <laughs> he had so much he had like he had just, he had he had lo, like a whole fucking charcuterie board in front of I him. I lost it when he pulled out the block of cheese. It looked <laughs> plastic. 
We all said we thought it was plastic, and then yeah. Anyway, and then he just and then it was jalapeno cheese, or like it was like ghost Amazing. pepper or, cheese or something or like that. Poor Jake. So he we, did it we, to we himself, him. but he did it for the bit. He did it for comedy. Um, uh, a man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, another death by monsters has that option. Oh, okay. Another. De- so then, if they do, then we'll look into it and we'll let you know for yeah. sure. Yeah. We'll check out. <clears throat> um, also, I, I will. Hermes asked also earlier, like uh, office tour when. So I'm just I'm gonna give a very brief, just look at my new kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll take you on. We'll take you all on a ride here. I put up some new art. Uh, let me move my mic out of the way a little bit here. I put up some new art on the wall that I have uh, that I got in a giveaway this summer from some art friends. And then uh, we've got a lot of familiar faces on this art wall. Alex Perkins uh, over here. Oh, wow. It's over here. Uh, this lovely new tapestry. And then courtesy of Ikea, uh, a whole lot of a whole lot of fake plants and oh, heck plants yeah. on the wall. So that's my oh, and a couple of a couple of um, breed on and specials here behind me on the wall. Nice. So much art. It feels so cozy in here. I absolutely love it. <laughs> um, I think that was all of our announcements, correct? Mm-hmm. I, I want to say it. yes. Okay. Cool. That's all that I wrote on my napkin. So. Great. Great. Um, that's all that I read. Uh, that's all that I have here on my zero notes. So, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Okay, well, we have like a topic or something I think we were going to get into. So, John, what do you got for us? Yeah. I'm just kidding. Wait a minute. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the bus this time was the – never mind. That was, That's not going to work. I actually do have a way to start this episode because oh, yeah. there is something that uh, that started, that brought, prompted us to talk about this topic, which was uh, rewards in TTRPGs, um, which was – uh, many of you who who follow Matt Colville and subscribe to Matt Colville on uh, YouTube may have recently seen his, I think his the most recent uh, running the game video, uh, where he talks about this very issue. Um, I thought about posting it earlier to be like, hey, the first ever, ever Ramble Mancy that has homework, but I, uh, I thought a lot about it, and in the end, I made the decision... I'm just kidding. I forgot. Um, <clears throat> I did just now post the video in both in chat and in the Ramplemancy channel in Discord. So if you want to go and watch it later. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really it. great video. Uh, hi- highly recommend it. It's very good. Um, oh, have a good lurk, Bree. Thank you for coming. Hi. <laughs> All right. Good night, Bree. Um, so, uh, yeah. So in the video, he basically talks about... I'm not gonna like summarize the whole thing. It's very, it's a very good video, pretty comprehensive, well thought out, and I am who I am as a person. So, uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, basically that like rewards in fifth edition D and D are pretty much limited to leveling up, because there's really no use for gold, at least not built into the game, like. Anything that is that any use for gold that there is in D and D is sort of brought to the game and imposed on it by the GM, and not has nothing to do with the game itself. Um, magic items effectively mechanically do the same thing that like abilities do when you when you, and plus the game isn't designed around uh, around magic items. It's it's not designed with any kind of assumption that you will have them or should have them. So there's really no incentive for you to go get them. Whereas in like previous editions, like magic items was kind of like how your character got cool and good at stuff. Um, so there's really no incentive to go get magic items other than that they are cool and it's fun to have more stuff to do. So like, uh, essentially like the, the, like the juice, the reward system like D D really only rewards uh their the players with advancement right which it rules as written means it only is rewarding a particular style of play which is fighting and killing monsters because 
mm-hmm. that's how you get experience right, right and so that kind of thing so really it's it's a question of how of what types of behavior a game rewards and that kind of tells you a lot about the game and how it's meant to be played and what it can and can't do well and so i've had a lot of thoughts about this recently so in in matt colville's video he does propose a a solution which is design rewards in from the ground up but since we can't do that because it's already designed it already exists we can sort of bring our own things and our own thoughts to it. And I think he has a lot of good things. I'm not going to try to summarize those things for you. But it did get me thinking a lot about rewards and the concept of rewards in TTRPGs and how this is sort of like it addresses the beginnings of a concern that I was starting to have about D&D specifically. Um, and... Uh, and hadn't really put real thought into. And so now I've started running through my head about like, this might be the, that one thing, that little like light bulb moment that will like make it possible for me to run the games that I want to run in D and D. Whereas before without this knowledge, I wouldn't have been able to do. So I thought we'd have a, we'd open the conversation. We'd talk about it um, and have, have a conversation about rewards and stuff. I like what Hermes said. Uh, here, which is versus uh, advancement through violence versus cipher, which gives XP through exploration, etc. Yes, exactly. And I think that's very cool, right? Like in cipher, you've got this like XP, which rewards that thing. But then the XP, can, there's a use for it beyond just advancement. You can use it for all any number of things. So you are encouraged to do things that will get you that XP. Um, so that's a very good example. And it's interesting too because one of it, like one of the other like player like a rewards for a player action are ciphers which also award an XP so like um, you are you are incentivized basically the two things that incentivize you to you know basically cipher is a system that is designed to be more like story and exploration driven. And then the way that they accomplish encouraging players to do that is going, okay, anytime you discover something new, you gain an XP. And anytime you search and successfully find a cipher, you also gain an XP, which encourages you not only to find ciphers, but to use them because you can only hold so many at a time, right? So if you're full on ciphers and searching for ciphers is useless, and thus you have denied yourself a way to gain, like, gain, like, gain one of the core, like, both resources and rewards that the system offers. It's very elegant, actually, Mm -hmm. that design. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have really haven't, I've spent most of my time since that video came out thinking about like D&D specifically, because that's where I feel like one, it's most applicable, probably, um, because uh, like, just because for me, that's where I've found the most problems in terms mm-hmm. of like motivating players to do stuff other than just sort of, I don't know. I'll, I'll get more into that later. I don't think it's directly relevant to this part of the conversation, but I imagine it's probably also pertinent in other games too, right? Like you, I think it's important to think about like his video got me thinking about how it's important to think about what behavior you are rewarding, whether it's because the game tells you to do that or because you the gm are doing that right Mm -hmm. um also hi john thanks for stopping in you're john um because it's also the fact that your characters can be built to facilitate exploration oh uh yeah to or or diplomacy yes Uh, i assume you're talking about in cypher so yeah 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 Mm -hmm. um yeah so I haven't really thought about this in terms of other games because most of my focus has been to like D and D because like you focus on where you where I where you feel there's a problem and for me it's been D and D like it's not like it's not that I don't want to run D and D it's that I haven't been able I felt like every time I've tried recently I haven't been able to quite like get at what I wanted it to be it's never it hasn't quite been the experience I wanted it to be. And I think that's in part due to the fact that um, that, like, have you know, like, 
so like base D and D, right? Like it's just sort of like everything that's in the books is in the world. Everything that's there, it sort of exists by and large in the way that it says it does in the books. And mm-hmm. it ends up being this very, like, in my opinion, tends to be very diluted because everything is in is in there, right? Um, there's so much stuff and the world tends to be over the top, all this sort of stuff. And my thoughts <clears throat> are that when, when, when I try to innovate, it's by trying to, like, say, okay, well what if we changed that? Like, certain things don't exist in this world. Like, for example, oh, there's no, I don't know, there's no elves in this world or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or magic is rare kind of thing, right? And the assumption is, like, oh, yeah, like, so if, like, for, for I'll use an example from, like, a thing that I did recently, which was, uh, I had a, a not a low magic setting, but a setting where there's low access to magic because knowledge of it had been lost in some sort of cataclysm. So the most powerful casters in the world probably can cast like fourth level spells. Um, and and that's a big deal, right? And the, I think the, like the, the assumption is the player characters are the main characters of the story. Therefore, they are, and also they are playing D&D and they know they're playing D&D. Therefore, they are the exception and will be the exception. Like they will learn to do things more powerful than that, become more powerful than the average, right? whatever. The problem is because we've been so like habituated to a certain style of D&D, when a player reaches fifth level and they get access to their third level spells or whatever that's they're like oh cool third level spells and then don't think about it again whereas in the world that's a big deal right but the player doesn't treat it that way because it is just a thing like leveling up and gaining levels is a thing that is taken for granted as like just part of the game right and sort of like i don't know this is There's some very tenuous connections here between the connections make sense to me because these are things that I've thought about in very specific cases in a general sense. I don't know how well these two like thoughts go together between rewards Mm -hmm. and like advancement. And I don't know. Well, I'm just, I'm just rambling at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, the name of the show. Uh, One of the things that I remember though, from watching that, that video was talking about like, kind of in that he kind of also addressed a situation like that where um you know components and foci unless they are things that are consumed upon the use of the spell i think are in my experience have been things that are largely hand waved um but like if if you want to like you can you can think about it this way in terms of like if you want to make acquiring certain spells more impactful like you can say to your player, okay, you're fifth level, you have the capacity to cast third level spells now, but like you're going to have to go find the com- the material components to cast them, and you're going to go have to find like the the actual like incantations or processes to like cast the spell itself, right? And so you can put in front of the player then, okay, if you go to this place, you'll find the things that you need, and then you can structure your encounters around that way and incentivize players and make that feel like a much more like kind of incremental advance or like a much more rewarding experience because they've sort of done something more than just exist to get it yes going along with that i want to say nico hit exactly see like a lot of this is me retreading ground that i've gone over over the last like like couple weeks but uh nico hit exactly the problem on the head which is uh the problem is that milestones in your character's advancement don't necessarily line up with the narrative arc the character goes through you're absolutely correct so i thought of a potential solution but this would only work in i think a particular type of game um which is the true sandbox style game right with player driven goals player uh player directed kind of gameplay where the players are put into a setting they derive their own goals and attempt to pursue those goals and there may be other like like plots happening in the world but they are not put in front of the players the players sort of stumble into them right this would only really work in this time which is you put a level cap and say you can level up until here after that you have to be proactive about your leveling after that if you want to like if you're third level if you want to get to fourth level 
then you have to go out of your way to earn that level, like go on a personal quest, right? Like a wizard to gain knowledge of ancient spells has to go into town, go to the archives, do some research about lost civilizations and powerful in magic and like ancient laboratories that were lost to history. And then the party goes on a quest, right? To help the wizard level up rewards, right? If D and D rewards by only one thing, which is advancement, don't just assume advancement. And I think this is the problem mm. that I was often coming up against in D&D, which is that, is that not understanding that the game itself really only re gives one type of reward. And me, I was just giving it to my players as assumed, right? Like, n without... And, like, I understand that this is a little bit how Milestone works, but milestone leveling works, but I think milestone doesn't go far enough. Milestone just says, "Oh yeah, you level up after you know reaching certain goals, certain milestones, or whatever." But I think that only works if you make those milestones like hard and fast. Like you do not level unless you reach those milestones, right? Right. And I think that that, t that takes a lot of steps towards putting the action kind of firmly in the player's hands. And I think I think the way that D&D's kind of, at least D&D 5th edition's like structure like this speaks a little bit to like its, its roots in like Tolkien-esque fantasy, where like you go on this grand adventure as a bunch of, you know, like uh, a bunch of like random people swept together by the winds of fate because it is the right thing to do. Uh, <laughs> And like, I know you can run it, you can, you certainly run into issues if you're playing like an all evil campaign or something like that with the assessment that I've made, in which case it is the wrong thing to do. And that's why you're doing it. <laughs> but like, <laughs> um, but you get the idea, which is that like, okay, so we'll go and do these things because that's what the game is supposed to like be about. Uh, or like, you know, we'll go and save the villagers from these goblins because like, that's the right thing to do as opposed to like the characters being like, I want to gain my insert fighter feat like that you get at level four here. Actually, I think that's an ASI. We'll say level five. Um, but, and and then going, and then like having the GM be like, okay, so how can I reward my fighter? And like in a, in a way that narratively makes sense here and saying, okay, so you'll hit your, your, your milestone for your character if you travel to this place, train with a mentor and like go through whatever that is. And then like you can you can structure all kinds of like cool combats and like training montages that involve the whole party in there. Like so yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um but that actually brings me to the other problem, right? Which mm -hmm. is so Matt Colville has said in various videos something that I never really understood, I think, until now. And that is that he says he really he really believes that like the more sandbox style of game, the more like sword and sorcery as opposed to heroic epic fantasy is what D and D is best at doing. And I didn't really understand that because I was like, well, I run like epic heroic fantasy and it works pretty well, but I didn't really understand what he meant until now, I think, which is that when you start really examining how some of the classes are designed, right? And some of their features, you start to realize, oh, I get it now, right? I get what he means because in the course of like a forward, like sort of driven narrative, heroic kind of fantasy, right? There's not a whole lot of time for side activities or if there is, they are few and far between and they are only given to you by the GM. The GM says, okay, we are now at this point. You can do whatever you want. But though, and but it's always with that like pressure of the narrative sort of pushing down on you. Like, okay, I do want to do some stuff, but I don't know what I can do because we have, you know, these world shattering issues to deal with, right? Or maybe not even world shattering, but like maybe even just, just high stakes things to deal with. Right. And so with there's when there's high stakes things to deal with, you're not just going to like, oh, no, goblins have kidnapped the blacksmith. Right. And they're going to perform a ritual wherein they sacrifice the blacksmith. That's cool. Uh, 
I know we got to do that, but I also really want to go and do some research for a little while, like my own research. <laughs> I know, like, I know it's bad timing, but, I, right? Like, that's not going to happen in Heroic Fantasy. <laughs> right. <laughs> or it might, I suppose, but, like, yeah, exactly, Hermes. Freedom to have downtime and follow small threads is sometimes missing, especially mm. in Heroic Fantasy, which leads me to my latest conclusion. Here we go. This is Lucas has revelations about himself live on the internet, okay? <clears throat> I am very bored. Of heroic fantasy this is what i'm learning i am very bored of heroic fantasy mm -hmm. uh yeah i i do like the idea of more and more for years i've been one you've probably heard even heard me talk about it here on the on ramble mansi i really want to run a sandbox game because i've never done it before and it sounds fun but I, but one of the things standing in my way was this problem of rewards, although I didn't think of it that way. But whenever I'd try to have any kind of sandbox elements in my games, and Freeman, I think you can back me up on this because you've been in most of my games. Um, yep. There's always this moment where you're like, okay, I've set the stage for you. What do you want to do? And then there are blank stares being returned <laughs> as players like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh and what it, what I realized is now the missing element is proper rewards and motivations for going mm. out and determining your own goals. Not only just rewards, right, but specific and explicit rewards. Not like just rewarding players for doing something, but telling them ahead of time, if you go do this this is the reward. Whereas if you go do that, this is the reward. And if you do this third thing, there's this third reward, right? And so it's not always the same thing every time. You can do all kinds of stuff. A permanent stat boost to, some, you know, to like a skill boost or something like that, or a, or a you know, permanent uh, like advantage on checks involving whatever, right? Something like that. Because like, I guess somebody might push back against that and be like, oh, but balance. But I'm like, it isn't balanced to begin with, right? Especially if you're rolling <laughs> your is... ability scores. If you are rolling mm -hmm. ability scores, some people are going to have lower scores. Yeah. Some people are going to have higher scores. It's no more unbalanced than that. So, like... <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna let everyone here in on just a little bit of a secret as somebody who works on TTRPGs a lot, which is that everything is as balanced as how the person felt, <laughs> how wild the person felt they wanted to be on the day that they wrote it. Uh, that's not universally true, but sometimes I will look at D and D shit and I'll be like, "Wow, you uh, you really really liked this class, didn't you?" <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah, exactly, Hermes. That is exactly what I think is appealing to me. The collaboration between players and DM is really important with that type of game, which sounds awesome. Exactly, that's what I think is so fun, and it also puts everything in the hands of the players. And then I think for me as a player. Something that I know I would find fun is knowing that I'd had an effect on the world somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And that things that happened in the campaign came as a result of choices that we, the players, made. Not the D the DM's uh, plot idea being put in front of us as the next thing to do, right? Like, that can be fun if you're willing to play along with that. And, like, it can be fun for sure, but it gets really easy to get bored of that really quickly because then it puts it forces you as a player. I, I've definitely had that had that feeling, and I'm sure lots of you have when when playing D and D. You have these all these ideas when you're making your character of what your character might get up to, things they might do, and whatever. But then you get into like the game and you realize that your ideas of what you wanted to do with your character do not align with the DM's ideas of what their campaign was going to be. And like some of that can be addressed through communicating ahead of time and talking about what the game is going to be like. But all, but not all of it. There's some stuff that you like you just the DM doesn't know to talk about because they don't know what's going on in your head as a player. And there's some stuff that you as a player wouldn't even know to ask about because in your mind, you're like, oh, I'm very excited to get into this world and get into like the, the guts of it. And it just sometimes doesn't happen that way. And we've all felt, I think we've all at some point felt that like moment of disappointment where we've felt our, our excitement and ideas for those characters die 
because we realize this is not going to work with the game that the DM has. And like, and I'm not saying that's a catastrophic failure or anything like that. That's something that is fixable. You can always go and say like, this is something I'd like to see in the game. But I think more often than not, that tends to be like sort of an issue at the bottom, right? Like if the campaign was not originally structured that way, it's very hard to course correct. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah. I don't think I've had that. Um, I have to say, because I build my characters so flexibly (laughs) because I want to improvise and make things up for them as they go. I make the character so bare bones in the very first instant in the very beginning. And I give a little bit of feedback about um, a little bit of background and whatnot, because you have to, you know, have something so that there's little tidbits that the, that the game master throws at you later down the road. Um, Mm -hmm. Something to do with like family ties, maybe come into play or something. But for the most part, I love to just, just be kind of like a few prompts and then just kind of, make it up as I go baby <laughs> sure that's completely fair and I think I'm less I, I, I think you, you you raise a good point and I think I, I'm less talking about I'm not, I'm not talking about so much about like having like an extensive backstory or like mm. so, like necessarily pre-written character goals because sometimes you discover those through play and that's fine I'm thinking more in terms of like uh um <laughs> welcome back colin uh i'm glad you got hey. yourself that sub badge um i'm thinking more in terms of so you talked freeman about like having like little like hooks into your like bones of your idea right but consider and i think this is kind of the thing that i'm talking about that's great and i love that and it works really well just as well as the person who writes like a 17 page backstory like it, it works just as well i think the problem, I think, sometimes is that when you have those things in your backstory, it's if you're playing a certain type of game, like the game that I think is is typically played in D anD D by most people, it's entirely up to the DM whether or not those things come into play. Right? You aren't offered the freedom to go and say pursue the like those things in your backstory. Like, for instance, if you were like if you wrote like a revenge plot into your backstory. If that's not compatible with the DM's idea of what the campaign is going to be, then that might never come up. And if you wrote mm-hmm. that as part of your into your character as something that's fundamental, that's a huge letdown, you know. And so I think uh, <laughs> Nico says if you're trying to play a diplomat in the 40k setting, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like true. <laughs> that's and so yeah, I think I think. You raise a good point, and I think that, and that I'm glad you've you as you've never, to your memory, have never experienced that moment, Freeman. Um, but yeah, like that, I, I guess it's I, true. I guess I'm more talking about like the idea that you know, like even if it's not like a clear concept of what your character is going to do, you have like these little thoughts, like you imagine, or at least I do, like imagine these little scenes that your character might have, like a thing that they might, a situation they might get themselves into, and then it just doesn't happen because that doesn't that doesn't fit into the GM's idea of what the True. campaign is going to be. Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think for another thing um, for me personally is I, I do, I think there's times where I do have really some cool ideas for my characters mm-hmm. and it, and it solely lays upon me to actually make them happen. And sometimes I personally just, am, I feel and feel a little, I think, timid about, about bringing that idea or making that play because I'm kind of worried about the, the the whole group as a whole that's actually exactly what hermes just said in the chat so like i i I agree with you i hermes says i think sometimes players have trouble pulling the entire party into a specific arc solely based on the on one character so as a dm that might be tough and yeah nico i agree character driven versus narrative driven campaign i think is the answer to that right because if there is no like big overarching thing that everybody needs to be focusing on then that does sort of free everybody up to talk about a little bit of it in an ideal world. I understand it's not always going to work out this way just necessarily because of the type of game that it is. But in an ideal world, which I think is a very achievable ideal, 
um, you have people, you have the players at the table discussing, okay, well, whose goals do we want to pursue today? Like, do we want to, you know, like you said you wanted to do this last week. Okay. And you said you wanted to go research a magic item. Okay. What do we want to, what do we want to do? And then you can talk about it amongst like the players and it's no longer the GM deciding where you go and what to do. It's the players sort of working together to determine what their goals are. And I think that's a very achievable thing, but it has to be within the context of a game that allows for that kind of conversation to happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'll say like, to, there's something to me as a player that's very satisfying about 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 thinking about like the kind of like resource management, management and logistics of like, okay, so in order to get the components to cast delayed fireball for you, we need to go raid this dragon's lair, which is going to be tough, but we did spend and like pulling out, you know, your map of the campaign. And like, I love, I love the idea of actually being able to like interact with that map and have it change over time. Like, you know, fucking like scrolling, scrolling, like the, the, the things you've got from interacting with different places in the world over time. Like, but remember that, like, couple of weeks that we spent like you know rooting out cultists in this city maybe we can go like ask the the captain of the guard for a few people to help us out or something like that or maybe like the adventurers guild will like will will like loan us a couple of people to help us out with this and like because you've got maybe plus two to persuasion in this city for helping out like that's 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 like an option to you now mm -hmm. um yeah. So like I don't know. Like I really I like the idea of just like a, a kind of a sandboxy campaign like that where over time like those little things build up and I it feels it feels to me like it would it would actually serve to give the world like more of a sense of place almost. Like I was I, I am I am continually or I was rewarded as opposed to just like ah oh, yes I leveled up from doing a thing here. Well like that happens everywhere you go. So like that's not necessarily unique but like you know having having been rewarded in different ways for like returning to or going to certain places i think makes more of a unique identity for them as opposed to well, we are killing things in a forest instead of a dungeon today right and i think when i say i think often i know i i say this maybe because this is what i thought when i heard it until very recently and i sort of saw it through a different lens that when people think, oh, sandbox versus a heroic RPG, it means like, oh, we're just random mercenaries, not heroes. And for some people, that's a deal breaker because they like playing as the heroes. But that's not what that means at all. It's not It's not what that means at all. You can absolutely – like, okay, I'll use an example from when uh, – Freeman, when we were playing Tomb of Annihilation, right? Which <laughs> – Tomb of Annihilation, I've said it many times on this channel <laughs> – incredible sandbox like an incredibly designed sandbox campaign setting and then there was this other stuff there was like this story that had an obscured but very present ticking time there was a uh, like high lethality meat grinder funhouse dungeon in there and any two of those things i think work well together but putting them all three together it became a problem but the point is Yes, exactly, Colin. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so, but we had a moment, right? So it is a sandbox, but we, and so for uh, a period of time, we were just sort of determining our own goals because we had the overarching goal of trying to find the lost city in the jungle. And we had to figure out how to finance the expeditions out there because we needed, you know, food, water, we needed rations. Or uh, we needed a like bug repellent, so we didn't die of disease because <laughs> oh, yeah, death is right. permanent. Um, we needed beasts of burden and whatever guides and and all that sort of stuff. So we needed to figure out how to finance these things. We did a quest where we went to uh, we went to help a uh, a dwarf um clear a dragon out of a mine who'd taken up residence in an ancestral mine of theirs and in return he would give us some of the dragon's hoard because he didn't care about that he just wanted the mine um we went in there and some of this stuff is not in tomb of annihilation some of this stuff as i am reading through tomb of annihilation now um <laughs> was just purely made up by our gm which like fucking props to him because he did an incredible job just throwing this cool yep. stuff in there that made great made perfect sense um, made for a cool story. So we get into this mine, we liberate the mine from the dragon, but then we find out, only to find out the dragon was, uh, this is spoilers for Tomb of Annihilation, by the way, um, 
not for the campaign, but for one of the storyline side stories in it. Anyway, only to find that the dragon was the only thing standing between uh, Chult and an army of, like, of salamanders and fire newts that had taken up residence deep within, like, in the, in the undercity. Um, so we then uh, learn from our guide that the goal wasn't the mine, but the ancestral home of the dwarves. And then we basically got to be there and say, okay, we will take up your cause, but you need to help us clear the lost city because we it's overrun and we can't do it ourselves and he's like okay deal you get us our kingdom back and we will help you and then it became this whole like rallying the dwarves and mm-hmm. like brokering alliances with with kobold and like this whole thing that we turned into and we were at the center of that and that was all from us that had nothing to do with like anything that was in the campaign some of that was even just made up by our dm and it was just so cool, and it felt like we felt, at least I felt, like we were heroes, right? We had yeah. taken up this cause, the dwarves. We were rallying the people to go and take back their home, and, like, it just felt so cool. That's not a thing that I think could have happened in a game that did not allow for sandbox. And hmm. so so sandbox and heroic are not necessarily exclusive. It's just a matter of, like, they're not mutually exclusive, you can still be heroes in a sandbox game. It's just that, like, you are... It's just motivations are different. You are not expected to do things in a sandbox because they are the right thing to do or the only thing to do. Um, you're expected to pursue your own goals. And if that if those goals happen to involve helping a group of people reclaim their ancestral homeland, then so be it, right? But, like... The point is that it was you, the players, who chose it rather than having it put in front of you as part of a plot the DM cooked up. And that's the real difference, I think. So, I don't know. <laughs> I I just think that kind of stuff is very cool. Yeah. I I still, the, that, the, the time in, it was this the same campaign that you skydived in, in Through the Mountain? Yes. <laughs> Okay, cool. That story lives rent free in yeah. my head. That's I the tell same, it to same mission. Other... We bypass the entire mine by just like SEAL Team sixing our way down through the mine shaft. <laughs> I still, I still like. I tell this. I want you to know that this, this is. It's such a cool story that I tell it to other people as a D and D story, and it's not even mine. Um, mm-hmm. The story of of how you you uh, resulted one of the many ways in which you resulted in your dungeon master that game just going well. We're not going to need this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, like, I think, Colin, this is a very good point. Uh, I will say the hex crawl elements were a bit tedious for my group, particularly the bug repellent and rolling for random encounters three times per day. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, completely fair. Not everybody likes that sort of thing. I maintain, I think, that if properly motivated and like i think that kind of stuff could still be fun i know tracking minutia is genu is uh generally thought of as like tedious and you hand wave it and you're just like whatever i don't need you to track rations or like water or any of that sort of stuff i maintain that if done well i think it could be fun even for players who don't typically like that style of play but I also understand that it's really hard to do that and that fundamental things about the campaign Tomb of Annihilation would have to change. Um, I have my own thoughts about how I would do that, but that's not super relevant here. But yeah, I think... Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I do understand that is not everybody's cup of tea. I think it could be really fun, especially if you really want to run a more like sort of survival style game, which I think goes hand in hand very well with a sandbox game and not mm. well at all with a with a with a heroic game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I think you know, is maybe the problem with like the Tomb of Annihilation storyline, right? Being part of that, because you've got I don't know. It's I don't think it worked well, but Yeah. He says, I do think that running a sandbox game requires way more prep, though, especially when it comes to uh, maps and location descriptions. I think, like, 
Oh, sorry. Hold that thought real quick, because I also I realized I forgot to address the second part of the thing that Colin said. As far as rolling encounters three times per day, absolutely agree. Hate that shit. Let's. Let, <laughs> let, anyway, that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> no, you're all good. Um, I think it. I think it's interesting. I think that it. I think. I think it's. I think it's less that it is. It's more work and more that it's. It just looks different. And I think like in a sandbox campaign as a GM, you probably want to change your style of prep to kind of accommodate what you're doing, which is to say that like absolutely like rely much more, I think on generators and like random tables and stuff like that, that's going to be your best friend. Like those, those like tables that, that lie unused in the DMG and Xanathar's Guide to Everything and Tasha's and all of those expansions that like will let you roll for super complex traps or will let you roll for random events or encounters that could just be like running into a brown bear or um, stuff like that. I think those are going to be enormously to your advantage because having tables like that, where if the player's like, we're going to go here today. And you're like, that's not what I expected. Um, <laughs> like I know in loose terms, what is there? Um, but you can, you can like, you know, with a few tables and a little bit of ingenuity, roll yourself a three room dungeon <laughs> so well like, and the other thing is you can do the like the approach that i call it putting down the train tracks in front of the train kind of thing right where it's like <laughs> yeah. if your players throw you for a loop and they're like we're gonna go over there and you're like uh okay sure but it'll take you a couple days to get there and uh and so then they do and then you just sort of make something up along the way to run the clock for the rest of the session or whatever to give them something fun and interesting to do during the rest of the session then take the week or however long in between sessions to plan i think you're right nico i think it it is more prep in some ways though i think you're right and mm -hmm. it is more prep in some way it is but i also think you're right john that it is more it is different prep also i think yeah. Um, players need far more information in a sandbox game than they do in a narrative focus game. Yeah, I I I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> that's and that, I think that's why why I agree with what you're saying, Nico. Is that mm -hmm. that that the amount of information that you need to know ahead of time as a GM is a little higher because it's not as like clear. I think you can kind of get away from that a little bit, though, because eventually, like, your players, in an ideal world, in a sandbox game, eventually your players will start talking to each other and start talking about their goals, and then you can sort of take that and sort of use it to figure out, to plan stuff, and before they start doing that, you can prep, like, two or three different things that they might engage with put those things in front of them give them that choice and then you have stuff that is prepared and then just sort of build outward from there i don't know if that made any kind of sense but i think you're right though like it it, it you can't quite uh because you're not on not on rails but like because you're not really like following sort of like a plot thread it's a little harder to plan for things I don't know. I actually, maybe it's just because mm -hmm. I tend to be a pants GM anyway. So like maybe yeah. it's just that. So I could be no. entirely wrong, but I have, I have quite literally like I, Lucas, you'll remember this session of our home D and D game that I ran, but I had, I had plans for y'all to get like into the next town and stuff, but I decided to roll a random encounter while y'all were on the road mm -hmm. and it was a rock. Yes. That's um, very cool. like a, <laughs> an, an ROC rock, like the the. No, it's just a rock in the middle of the road. Just like <laughs> that's kind of oh, cool. Like, nice. It's not a boulder. It's a <laughs> you rock. Found you, you found Dwayne. Uh -huh. Dwayne. They came across Dwayne the Rock Johnson <laughs> in the uh, in the middle of the road, <laughs> so they had to they had to play that out. Um, but no, like I think I think it was. It, I, I can't remember if it was a table in Xanathar's or if this is just in the base DMG. I think it might be the DMG, but I just I just rolled a random encounter based on the train that they were in, and it was a rock, which is this giant, <laughs> this giant kin bird um, that, for the level that you guys were, would have been a pretty challenging fight for yeah, all of that you. Yeah, rough. And so what the system, like in, in the kind of like laying down the tracks in front of the players, like what that session wanted, because I only had like half of the town session planned, but it was nice then because like it turned into like a two or three day survival challenge of the players like moving at night, 
and avoiding like the rocks like hunting times and then like keeping an eye on it during the day and laying low and finding places where they could hide out of sight of a giant fucking eagle with ridiculously good vision and a very wide hunting grounds so yeah <laughs> welcome back Bree. it's a glowy rock that does weird gravity stuff and no one can figure out what it is and it just confuses them forever um, yeah it took the whole session Hermes said, oh, that's very cool. 1985 Games has a deck of premise NPCs and a storytelling deck, which can help with some of those randomization. That's very cool. I did not know that. Um, but also, Hermes said, uh, I think Forbidden Lands does a decent job with the hex movement and random encounters. I actually don't know anything about Forbidden Lands. So, like, I just, I've heard people talk about it. I know nothing about it myself. But that does make me a little bit curious about it. I... I think I am just one of those rare people who just I really enjoy things like hex crawls and like I don't necessarily like inventory management as anyone who has watched me stream Mass Effect would uh would could attest to but I do like logistics right so Tomb of Annihilation the expedition part of it for me was very fun and engaging because it felt like trying to solve a puzzle the puzzle being like like, how are we going to get, what do we need? How are we going to get it? Um, and, like, I think that's, that's, that's very fun for me. Like, it worked really well in our game where it was me and Henry were kind of, like, the logistics people where, like, I handled the, like, what do we need and how are we going to get it part and, like, planning how we were going to acquire the things that we needed. And Henry kept track of the inventory, which he enjoyed doing. Um, and I think that was a very cool dynamic, which allowed us to do that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, question, why is fantasy sandbox so much harder than sci-fi sandbox? I genuinely don't think I have an answer for that question because mm -hmm. I don't know that I've ever considered that difference before. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Like, there's a... Yeah, wow. I think, okay, so here's my answer to that question. Here's my answer to that question, which is that I think when we think in terms of sci-fi sandbox, the first thing that comes to mind for me is like Star Trek, which the, the show itself really is kind of just like a monster of the week style. Like you have, this is this week's problem that the crew of the Enter Enterprise faces. Um, and so there's something, there's something about like, you're always on the starship and I'm thinking about specifically playing stuff like Star Trek adventures, but like, you're always on the Star Trek on the starship enterprise and you're encountering something weird and out of the normal. Um, and like, it can kind of be anything. And so you have, you have the, the, the leeway to kind of just have like a string of wild unconnected adventures. Um, because that's sort of like what everyone expects. It's like, ah, yes, the wackiness of space. Who knows what the heck is out here? Um, and fantasy, <laughs> I think weirdly, like, if you're talking about a, like a big open world fantasy, it's almost like there's, it, it, the, there's so much choice, I think, is to be paralyzing in terms of like the kind of fantasy game that you're playing what genre of fantasy like and i know there are lots of genres of sci-fi too I'm, I'm, I'm speaking like specifically to a certain kind of sci-fi game i think there's a lot of really good answers in chat that's good that's some good points but i think there's also a lot of good answers in chat because i think nico actually kind of says i'm not sure if this is the quite the opposite of what you said but smaller ecosystem if you were if you were to play a sci-fi sandbox in a single city or on a single planet it becomes just as hard i think that's probably very true because it the what Okay, that actually, that answer, Nico, gave me my answer, which is uh, scope, right? Like, it's essentially what you're, what you're saying, Nico, but it's in terms of focus and detail, right? In a fantasy setting, like Hermes said, ease of travel, right? And, it, and this is a little bit what happened to me in Infinite Horizon. With Infinite Horizon, I started to get, feel like the game kind of got out of hand for me in terms of... Uh, it wasn't particularly grounded and it's not grounded literally, but also not grounded in the sense because anytime anything it happens, like the crew can just sort of whoosh off to somewhere else. And so there's not really much incentive to make it grounded because you like you, gr the way things get like 
you tell grounded stories and you talk about grounded settings and characters. Well, characters is actually the, the easiest one because everywhere you go, you're going to find people and sometimes the same people. But it's in detail. It's in level of detail. Um, you can't get into a lot of detail, if, especially if you know that your characters are just kind of going to whoosh off, right? So it becomes a little easier to do that sort of more sandbox kind of thing where they're just kind of going to that place and like, ooh, what's over there? Okay, great. Because you don't have to, you're not expected to have the, like, the kind of detail required. Uh, whereas, and like Hermes said, ease of travel affects that as well because it, the, e the tr ease of travel and the methods with which you travel has the capacity to greatly shrink how much of the world you can see or greatly expand it and that has a direct impact on detail, which has a direct impact on, like, how you can ground something. And, like, anyway, yeah, that... <clears throat> yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. I also think Brie... Yes, Brie, very similar, I think, because fantasy has limits in sci-fi. You can kind of just keep going, and it's just wild, and anything happen that happens is, like, okay. Yes, I think that's also part of it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like what I was what I was getting at with like the way that Star Trek is a show and also Star Trek Adventures is structured where it's just like you're just kind of strung along from one wild thing to the next and that's how it goes because you can turn on a warp drive and be at a different planet with a whole different set of stuff, you know, in the blink of an eye. Mm hmm. Nico says it's interconnected. It's the uh, the interconnectedness. Hopping from one city to another in a fantasy game will not get you out of range for the consequences of your actions. In a sci-fi game, you jump between planets or even solar systems. Yeah, yeah. You're not. You're. You aren't necessarily around to see the consequences, good or bad, of your actions. Um, because you don't have to be. Uh, Colin says. One thing I've always found interesting is how quickly time progresses in a campaign. My home game has been notoriously slow in a good way. Several sessions have just lasted one day in a game, whereas travel sessions may see several weeks pass by. Yeah, that's very interesting. I actually have a, uh, for the first time ever, and I think if I ran my true sandbox game that I want to run, I would do that. I would do it again. Um, for the first time ever, I actually had a calendar app that worked really well for how I run, run my games and I was actually tracking amount of time and you can track it in the app that I used you can track it down to the half hour so like you can and you can real time update it you can kind of tick it along as you go which is pretty cool I liked that aspect of it um uh, oftentimes as a GM, I have events sort of exist in a story limbo of sorts where I know something is going to happen. They can really just happen whenever it would actually impact the story rather than on a set time frame. Yeah, that's cool. That that's that is how I had previously done it. I think uh, before tracking using a calendar. I think that's how I how I did it too. It's it works. It's it's a very workable way of doing things. Um, I think they just it's just a matter of difference of what you're trying to accomplish probably. That's my guess anyway. Um Oh yeah, Bree, this is this is also a good point. Uh also a lot of times in sci-fi you usually make planets one thing. Every time you go to planet it's just one problem. It's it one thing that it is, but in fantasy the planet you are on is just as varied as uh slash should be as varied in culture and life if not more so than the real world. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's a very, very good point. A fantasy world like is is more contained in terms of like it, like you kind of you kind of get the oh my goodness my camera, um you kind of get the same idea like you world build actually in similar ways right in that sci-fi sci-fi like where one planet is one thing but the distance between those things is much greater, right. So like in a fantasy world, going from the elves who are kind of usually an analogy for one thing and the dwarves, the, this dwarvish society who are also an analogy for one thing, but those are like right next to each other and it's a couple of days of forced travel away as opposed to warping across the galaxy from one planet that has this one set of problems or like, you know, they are one way and then like you kind of zip off to another place and that's, <laughs> you know, it's the, the removal between those things is greater. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think we've kind of gotten a little bit off the topic of like 
rewards and stuff like that. But it's all related, I think, because I think in many cases the type of the type of game that you play and that you end up playing, it's not always determined by the GM. In fact, more often than not, I've found it's determined by how the players interact with the game, mm. which has actually largely been my frustration with D&D because the players are very habituated to, like, because D&D is so, like, mainstream, it's in, like, the zeitgeist. It's sort of what a lot of people, most people in TTRPGs, I would say, uh, know um there is a particular style of play and that is what players are habituated to and so no there's an incredible amount of inertia to kind of get people out of the rut no matter how much you try as as a dm if you don't understand what is causing them to stay in that rut it's going to be really hard the players really end up dictating what kind of game you're running and so um what i have what i think it's very important to think about, um, which is something that I hadn't thought about before seeing Matt Colville's video, what kind of game you're, you want to have, and then ask yourself, am I rewarding that style of play adequately? And more often than not, I think with D&D, the answer is no. Um, mm -hmm. At least for me, that was the case. Um, because I had very specific like ideas in my la most recent campaign of what I wanted that game to be and it did not happen but I think that was largely due to the fact that I one there there were a lot of problems with 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 uh not problems necessarily but little things that all kind of came together to sort of uh make it so that my my vision for that game didn't quite happen um but two I didn't really think about how, like, was I rewarding my players for, or or incentivizing players towards that style of game, or was I just sort of going with the defaults of the game? And the answer was, as you have probably figured out by now, that no, I was just sort of going with the default of the game, um, which is to say... Uh, largely just the the one thing the game rewards was sort of a thing that like was being taken for granted by both myself and the players and we just kind of ended up in the same place in spite of everything all the work that I had done to make this setting and this campaign different it ended up being a little bit more the same so yeah yeah that Pretty neatly brings us to the end of our time for tonight, too. Hey, look at that. <laughs> the first Ramble Nancy of the year ending almost on time. What? Oh, don't worry. We'll, we'll still have <laughs> plenty of time to fuck that up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we really do. Um, oh, that's a mood. Uh, that's a mood, Gigouts. I, yeah. would, I, I would love to be able to play it run. Uh, games more regularly like we said at the very beginning of the stream scheduling is truly the uh the the big bad evil guy of mm. <laughs> of tabletop rpgs yeah Whew. all right well i don't remember Here how we, we end these things yeah i don't remember how we end these things which is i think the case all the time so i think we're doing great yeah, no, usually we kind of just plug our stuff and then Minnesota goodbye until we run out of steam. So, um, yeah, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, tune back in for our very first Ramble Nancy of the year. If you weren't around at the beginning, we announced a whole bunch of exciting stuff about our Patreon, the kind of cliff notes of which is that we are introducing some new stuff at the $5 and $10 tier, uh, and also like kind of uh, tinkering with another thing at the $10 tier. Uh, there will be the $10 tier specifically, we're adding uh, town hall meetings that we'll post recordings of on, uh, on Patreon, where patrons can come and like meet with us, hang out um and kind of get the scoop and weigh in about stuff that's upcoming on the channel uh as well as kind of tinkering with uh, the world builders writers room a little bit and then at the five dollar tier we have beyond the roll coming in which is a kind of 
series of episodic Canada adjacent adventures set in the universes of our of our actual plays. So like side stories in the Infinite Horizon universe, in the uh, cyberpunk red setting, and you know kind of other things that we want to revisit or check out. So lots of cool stuff coming this year on Patreon. Yeah. Um, as always, if you wish to be kept apprised of the things that we are doing when we are doing them. I don't know why I said it like that. Join the Discord. Uh, <clears throat> is a place where you can talk about all of the things that we have talked about here, but more. I don't know why I'm, I don't know. I, love I it. got stuck no, in that good. voice. Keep and doing it. <laughs> I got stuck there. That's where we're at. Uh, <laughs> yeah, join the Discord uh, if you're not in there already. Um, which chord, Amethyst? I think you know. You've been around for a long time. You know which chord. Uh, <laughs> Is it perhaps this I chord? I guarantee the answer is no. Is it perhaps <laughs> this chord? Not. Oh my gosh. Who needs this? What does this even connect to? It's so terrible. Anyway. Terrible. Not that chord. It's definitely not that chord. Bree um, says that's the ROL wi uh, wizard voice. Yes, exactly. We need to send a replica of an old time radio microphone to Lucas. That's true. Uh, we really needed that for Republic City Rumble when you recorded the ad for that. Like uh the old timey like voice mod that you had for mm -hmm. that and the voice mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, but yeah um that's it that's all we got so uh we are excited to be back excited for what's coming up um we hope to see y'all in the in the future and what what it comes um looking forward to it it's gonna be a big one i'm sorry i was just looking for an excuse to do it um we will see you on Tuesday for In Too Deep, uh, 4.30 p.m. Pacific time, right here on this very channel. Uh, but if not, we will see you the next time you decide to come roll with us. Good night and good zone.